Welcome to Manifold. My guest today is Taylor Ogan. He is the CEO of Snow Bull Capital, a hedge fund based in Shenzhen, China. Taylor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Uh, I uh, understand that it was just earlier this year that you moved to China. Am I correct about that? Yep, January 2023. And uh, you're a rather unique entity because you might be the only wholly foreign-owned enterprise in the hedge fund space based in China. Is, is that true? At least by Americans, yes. Okay. The government told us. Great. So I, I wanted to start by just asking a little bit about your, your background and how you got into the hedge fund industry and then maybe culminating on why you decided to move to China. Sure. Um, so in 2018, um, I founded Snowball Capital in Boston originally. And uh, the plan was never really even to have a focus on China. Uh, our focus centered around investing in green technology. So high tech, new tech, clean tech, and green tech. And it just so happened that since 2018, um, China, Chinese companies happened to start really dominating those industries. And so the focus had to start shifting more towards Chinese companies. And it definitely isn't popular among most American investors um, to kind of, you know, discuss Chinese investing opportunities, uh, but we couldn't leave it out of the conversation. And if we tried to ignore China, it, it felt wrong. And so um, that that's kind of how we we focused more and more on China. And five years later, I mean, now we're we're in China. Um, we we expected to be in China, uh, but definitely not living here. We expected to even three months out of the year. I mean, a significant amount of time. Uh, but then COVID happened and we realized that the research was, was the first thing we noticed. The research just fell off. And equity research, I mean, everyone pulled their analysts out of China. And a lot of them were never in China. They were in Hong Kong or in Singapore. And so they would go on a China trip, oftentimes less often than we. And... The research, it just, it was always bad, but it got, it just went to zero. And so we had, we had no like real grasp and trying to talk with executives from Chinese companies, Chinese IR, it's, they don't like to do it over Zoom or, you know, Skype or anything. They, they want you to be there. And if you are there on a site visit, they'll open the doors to you. I mean, they'll, they'll answer so many of your questions, but they, they, will barely even respond to email. I mean, if you have WeChat, they, you may get a response. But so we had no communication with these amazing opportunities. And we also couldn't find, we, we didn't have a, a good feeling that we could find new opportunities in China um, because we physically couldn't get there. And so we started looking at ways of how we could cleverly get into China um, visa-wise. And, and then... The U.S. started to, you know, kind of spiral um, down, I'd say, in, in terms of innovation uh, during COVID. And I mean, all of the disinformation and, and people couldn't trust their own government. Um, it, was, it started just getting socially ugly for the United States. And so we kind of looked at how China was handling a lot of this, and, and it kind of... Um, I'd say, I'd say it divided us. Um, our office was, was like an outsider would say, wow, you guys are really pro China. And, and it was, you know, we were, we needed to see like the daily COVID numbers and you couldn't get that even in Boston. I mean, you had to, it was, there were large estimates. Um, but, but China was just so transparent and this may surprise a lot of people, but they really were. And, and now we have the perspective that they definitely were. Um, and so China kind of reopened like pretty quickly, but within itself, right? So not to outsiders. And it's still, I mean, the, you look at the tourism numbers in China, it's still not nearly, it's like 20% of what it was pre-pandemic. So it was, we really wanted to get to China. 
And one, one night at dinner with my team, I floated the idea of what if just for a year or two, maybe three, we actually moved to China. Now keep in mind, one of our analysts had never been to Asia before. So, and she actually was the first one who said, I thought you'd never ask. And so uh, it suddenly became really real. And like the next day at work, we started looking into, could, could we actually like set up an entity in China? Um, and so each of those days got more and more serious. And we started having real meetings with the few firms that help companies do this. And they're, they're mostly factories, right? They're, they're not, you know, white collar firms. So uh, it was, we had to do a lot of things that really had never been done. And we started measuring our paperwork in terms of pounds. So, uh, and, and so the, the entire process took a year and a half from when, from that dinner to when we actually stepped foot this January in China. And uh, it was, we kind of expected that process we were initially quoted six months. So for a year, we had to be bogged down by thinking basically tell, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, but like telling family members, like some of them were elderly, like kind of having to say goodbye. like, this is a very serious move. And I mean, we don't have, no one's married in, at my company. Um, and so, you know, we didn't have to give up maybe as much as a company moving their entire headquarters to China would. Uh, but, and no pets, which maybe would have put the kibosh on it. Uh, but it was, it, it really was like telling friends, like I'm moving to China. I don't know when I'm going to see you next. And you know, it, it was, it's, it's more than just the business element. I mean, it, it is actually personal. Was there anybody on um, your team that was opposed to the move or did you lose any team members over the move? Uh, we, we, no one was opposed. We did have an analyst, Connor, who's great. Um, who was not eligible for his visa. Um, and so he's, we parked him at a, uh, at a, a company that, um, needed some help internally. Um, and he since twice with this company. So, um, he's very happy and we're very happy to get him back once he's eligible. Um, but he didn't have enough working years out of college. And so the Chinese are very strict about this. Um, and, and so. Yeah, I mean, I, I would call that a loss. Um, but he, I mean, I was just we chatting him a few minutes ago. I mean, he's he, he really wants to to live here. Um, so yeah, we we did have a loss. Um, but the point is that the again, a fly on the wall would see all, these only Americans and one of whom had never been to the continent before agree and very seriously have conversations every day leading up to it for a year and a half about, especially amid all of this, I'm moving to China. Uh, so even the Chinese side, like our counterparts in China were like, are, are you sure? Like this is, you know, lockdowns and everything. We were prepared. We were prepared for not just three weeks of lockdowns, but also flying into Hong Kong and going through those lockdowns. So that's kind of why it, it became extra personal. Like when we had to say to our friends and families, like, it doesn't make sense for us to hop back and forth all the time like we would before COVID. Now we actually can do that. Um, but we didn't know when China would really fully reopen. So, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a, a little emotional, but it really, I think that's a, an important part of this. And so finally, and I the other thing is what delayed us another year is actually the U.S. The Chinese side was very fast. Um, they're the consulate website would say, this is, this document's going to take, you know, three weeks and it would take like two and a half weeks. Um, so the very accurate granted, I don't think they're processing a lot during that time. Uh, but yeah, the U S side was just so slow. And the sad thing is we kind of thought that we tried to not put that we are going to China. Like this document needs to be, you know, authenticated because it's going to China, um, as much as possible, which is really sad. Um, and still we were delayed that long. Um, so eventually in mid January, we, uh, fly in land in Shenzhen and it was, it was surreal, um, because it was, it was such a long time coming and it just, I hadn't been back in four years. And, um, and you know, for one of my colleagues, she had never even seen Shenzhen. Um, so yeah, it, we, we finally got here and 
the only regret that we have is not moving here sooner. Uh, even with the lockdowns, we would have done it. Yeah. And uh, it the opportunities here are tremendous. And I think maybe I have a very unique perspective. And just since, you know, 2023 is a huge year for especially Chinese tech. Um, even the EV penetration rate, like I can see that with my own eyes since I first landed here. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable in such a short period of time. Can I ask you just a couple in the weeds questions about the logistics of what you went through? So are are you on something like a 10-year business visa or something like that? Yeah, so that is, it, it renews every single year or two years after your first six months. So it's, I'm right now on a, on a two-year work visa. Okay. Um, it's not a business visa. It's, it's even better. Um, and yeah. And our, by the way, our company is wholly technically our, our parent company is still based in the U S um, as a Delaware company doing business in Massachusetts. Um, but, but our Shenzhen, it's Shenzhen snowball company. Uh, that is, that is wholly owned by our parent company. Um, but that allows us some pretty unique, um, things that in China, and some things we, I think we're going to be trailblazers, I have to say, uh, in crafting some, some frameworks that have never existed. Uh, because the Chinese government at the, you know, Beijing and even down to the district that our office is in, they want people like us. They, they don't care if we're America. I mean, it's almost better because it, you know, helps bridge things. Um, they're very supportive of us being here. And Honestly, we, we didn't know what to expect. We thought that even from, you know, counterintelligence perspective, like this could look bad, right? Um, one of our, one of our analysts worked in the state department. So like we were worried about that. Um, and no, that nothing has, uh, a l we're a little slower at, uh, the, the borders just because they haven't seen many American passports. Um, so, could so yeah, but no, it's been fine. Just for my own personal interest, because when I first heard your story and your story is actually really unique, I think I bet during the whole COVID era, you're, you know, not even, I mean, beyond finance, you're one of very few companies that relocated to China during this period of time, probably. So everybody else was going the other way. So yeah. I was kind of thinking through, like, how would you do this? And I was wondering, like, if you were some kind of like Cayman Islands registered entity, could you not just somehow get to China and operate there, but all the trades are executed abroad and you're, you're telling, you're, you're making the trades from China, but you don't actually have to be a China-based company? Would, like, would that something like that have actually worked? You, you could do that, but not in terms of actually uh, like getting a permanent residence. It's actually, it's really hard. I see. Um, you would, you'd be better off, like, I guess, pretending to be a teacher or something. Yeah. And trades, you know, <laughs> a day trade, they, they even a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, that would be a good movie. Um, but they, they check that like they, they will send people and like take a picture of like you in your office to make sure that like you're actually there. Um, I mean, they do that in the U S too, but, uh, yeah. So it, it was, we, we also really didn't want to go offshore because if things got nasty, China may fully contain itself. Yeah. And, and we, we still have to consider that. So because of that, there is, we face ourselves, no delisting risk. There is still actually a risk of American individuals cannot invest in certain companies. Mm -hmm. For example, SMIC, mm -hmm. that, that hurts us. Um, and so we're looking to establish even, um, I would say safer, um, uh, structure in China so that we actually could, and uh, this is all not to get around anything. It's to be as pure, as legitimate as possible. And that will mean closing off access to American investors. Yep. And that's uh, another, another route that we are going towards, uh, which is, it surprised us, but Chinese people, you hear about Chinese people want to move their money out of China and everything. Certainly some do, uh, but they are surprisingly receptive to They've shown a lot of interest in having us manage their money, investing in Chinese stocks. I, when I say it, it sounds crazy because like my Chinese is horrible. Even like they, how, how, why, what, what do we know that Chinese people don't know about their own companies? And it's the Western perspective. 
And it's something that I, I guess I've taken for granted, but it is very different. Like mainland born Chinese are, have very different perspectives than Americans. And, uh, it, it translates into a lot of Chinese actually have, they're, they have, they're too bearish on things that are happening before their eyes. And I could give you a million examples, but, uh, that's something that surprised us. And so that's even better for us. Like the, the risk, the risk that, you know, the anxiety that I feel every day is, is dwindling since I've been here. And I definitely did not expect that. I thought, you know, I have to put up with a lot. Um, but no, it's, it's actually, you know, especially in China, the more pure you do something, the more clear your structure is, the better you're going to be. And that sentence may surprise a lot of, a lot of, no, I, I think, but... I think I understand where you're coming from. So, um, it sounds like before you went to China, your LPs were all uh, Western or American. Yeah. And, but now you might be picking up some LPs that are, uh, in, in China. When, when, yeah, it would be a separate fund. I see. Before you went though, your exposure to China, was it always through shares that were listed on Western exchanges or, okay. And now, good question. but now, but now you're actually investing in country. Yeah. If you could go into that a little bit. Yeah. So we have been closed off from the A share market. And even if you're familiar with VIE structure, variable interest entity, this, this is Cayman Islands owns a share of like Jack Ma's yep. stake in Alibaba. And so through, so like all of that, we, we got out of all of that as when we could, there were like two companies that we couldn't for a while. Like there was no other, but you started seeing these secondary listings or dual primary listings from Chinese companies that were listed on NASDAQ or New York stock exchange that realized the delisting risk was getting too high. And so they needed to have a secondary offering on Hong Kong. And so. We, we owned a lot of Chinese companies, but we're limited to only owning companies that have H shares and we don't own the ADRs. We, we own the pure H shares. Um, but the, the A share market, you know, granted it, ha it hadn't been doing so well. Um, but there wasn't a lot of volume in it. And since, since really, I mean, we've moved here, you've seen, um, you've seen this Hong Kong stock connect with Shenzhen and Shanghai, where you can own northbound and southbound, like th these things and dual counters, like they're, they're really trying to, to open that up, but it's still very difficult for Americans to own a shares. And so, uh, that was something that we, we didn't have. And so this is us being here. There are even rules that because I just myself am here living in China. If I live here for two years, it opens up a lot more for, for me to access. Right now we could have access to that, but we'd have to go through local people. Um, and you know, th there's some, some trust issues from some LPs with, of course, with that. Um, but yeah, after two years of me living here, it will be essentially, I mean, unfiltered access. Got it. So this is probably a dumb question, for, but for the H shares, there's no issue of converting. Like if you, if you sell, if you, if you uh, liquidate those shares and convert to dollars, there's no issue, right? There's no issue of getting your capital out. No. But, but if you go That's fully right. into the uh, RMB denominated shares, uh, then like there is still, like you could make huge windfall, uh, but then like getting the money out could still be challenging. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it actually is challenging. Um, and I know of ways, you know, that people, um, go around that as much as they can, but I don't think they're going to last long. Like the Chinese government is, is smart. They, they know, uh, what to look for. And so that's another thing with opening a fund in China for China. Makes sense. Yeah. By Chinese yeah. is like, I, we had to have a discussion with my colleagues, like, Hey, if this gets really successful and you have a lot of money, you know, that's, that's going to be, you know, you build your summer home in China. Yeah. Um, because I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't know how easy it may be for us to get that money back to the U S. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that definitely, there is truth to that. Um, and I, I also though, see that changing Great. in the next 10 years, um, hopefully five years, but 
there's no way that China can grow to be this big and still have things like this, you know? Yep. So, yeah, you know, we might have gotten a little bit too in the weeds in the financial and regulatory details for my audience, but so maybe we could just, I, w I was personally interested because I, I don't really quite understand what the best way to get exposure to Chinese companies is. So that was a little bit for me and maybe not so much for my audience in general, but yeah, or let's, let's, um, backtrack a little bit and talk about, I think, so I haven't been back to China since I was there this summer, right before COVID I was in Beijing in 2019 and I haven't been back since then. And I'm probably going to go this summer, but, um, I'll look you up, but, uh, um, yeah. uh, so a lot of my listeners probably haven't been there for even longer. And so for me, every time I go there, it's just amazing how much the place has developed. Um, Shenzhen is one of the most advanced cities. I think I heard you talking specifically about, you know, robo taxis and drone deliveries being a real thing. Now talk a little bit for the audience, just about the wonders of like stuff you see in Shenzhen from day to day. Yeah. It's funny because I, let's say I, I tweet a video of, of a drone delivery. Um, there will be people who comment, you know, they never can be uh, positive comments. Um, th they'll say something like if they haven't been to China, I don't really care. I won't even entertain it. But there are people who say, I lived in China between 2012 and 2018. And like, you may be showing a little pocket of China, but that's not accurate. And you know it and I know it. And it's like, wow, I didn't expect the people like who really want to, to like harp in on this, to be like, have lived in China or be Chinese. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, I don't know how else to, you know what? There, this is a little unconventional. This is how common drone delivery is. I don't, it's probably super washed out, but uh, right there in this park is the, is the nearest drone delivery to me. We may even see one right now. Wow. Um, you'll probably see a robo taxi. No, I actually don't see a robo taxi right now, which is surprising. Um, and I mean, also look at all the construction. Like this is the drone delivery, the robo taxi, the, all of these things, it, it's real. Um, and so it's, I know it's not normal for other Chinese cities, maybe, but it's getting more normal. And so if you go to Beijing, I'm going to Beijing in two days. I don't think that they have drone delivery. They have more robo taxis than Shenzhen though. It's one of the reasons I'm going. Um, so like the, the cities vary, but the overall theme is, I would say the period that you haven't been will be the most unrecognizable you've ever seen. Yeah. And because it was for me and this was, I spent most of my time in China in Shenzhen and it is like where I am right now, the last time this building, all of those buildings you saw that were complete, uh, were not even built. Like, I don't even think they broke ground when I was last here and I was not, you know, it wasn't that long ago. So, I mean, when you see entire, it's not neighborhoods, it's districts that are just Tencent is building its own city a few miles away from here. I mean, it is, it is crazy. So, um, yeah, the, you will not recognize at least some parts of some cities For Shenzhen, it's like the whole city. They're even tearing down buildings that are like 20 years old because they weren't really, you know, it's a four story building and, um, and they're building, you know, a new headquarters. So it's, you're not really seeing that in other cities for sure. But, uh, yeah, in, in Beijing, Shanghai, even Chongqing was like, this is, yeah, how can this city really modernize that much? Oh, it has, it really has. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be unrecognizable to you, but I really encourage you and, and anyone, even, especially if you've never been to China. Um, but like the other thing is I, if you haven't been to China really since COVID, your opinion, especially on tech and innovation can't be complete. It's impossible. Even if you're not talking about like Chinese specific innovation, it is, if you don't actually see it, if you don't hear people on the street talking about semiconductors, like that's just normal, at least in Shenzhen, that's like normal. And so you really need to get a, a good pulse. Um, and so 
yeah, I, I really encourage anyone to to come here now. So for the um, those internet people that you just mentioned, like on Twitter, that have you know everything about China has to be negative. There's a big, you know, meme or I guess propaganda idea in the Western media, which I'm sure you've seen, which is that you know the economy is close to collapse in China and things like this. And granted, for sure, they're having some problems with the property sector. What's yeah. the gen What's your general feel? It, uh, does it seem like, uh, do you see a bunch of empty buildings with no one in them? And uh, does it seem like the economy is about to collapse? Yeah, I, I do see a lot of empty buildings because they haven't put the glass on the outside yet. Um, they, the, you know, real estate is the biggest concern. Um, and I will say the Chinese with whom I speak are, they're warriors. Um, and they... They really like, they'll send me a Reuters article about like China's economy is collapsing and they'll be like, Taylor, check this out. Like, what do you think? And I'm like, you, you're the Chinese. Like, you, can you, why are you sending me Western like media? And, and it is because the, the Chinese media doesn't really comment on the economy. Like it, it, it's like, they're not opinionated about it. Like Western media is. Um, so yeah, I mean, China's collapse has been, people have been calling for it for the last 20 years. Uh, I don't see any signs of it. I see in definitely some, there's some sectors that I would just completely avoid. Uh, there are also some sectors that if, I won't name names, but we probably are thinking of a lot of the same names. Uh, if you think about that company, and this is, this is like a list of companies, in five years, it would so much would have to go wrong. Like we're talking full out war, China complete crackdown on technology as we know it, like for it not to, for its stock price not to be higher than it is today. And I can't say that about American companies. I really can't. Even some of, some of the darlings, right? NVIDIA, Apple, I don't know. And that, that's, those are kind of deemed like safe investments right now. And that's no longer true. And, and this may have been a different conversation six months ago, um, but we can get into specific technologies later if you want. But the, the economy as a whole, I don't see it um, like you've probably read. Um, I, I will say that people do right now, they're calling Shenzhen, like there's China and then there's Shenzhen. So I am living in a bit of a bubble, um, but I travel all over China. And, and yeah, you don't see growth as much, but again, we're talking about growth. So if, if GDP growth declines year over year, yeah. I mean, we're still talking about GDP growth at, at quite high numbers, not, not 2010 China numbers, but we're, we're, it's that may be slow. I don't call that slowing. Uh, and so the, I mean, there's, I, I live above a, a mall, which is kind of weird to say, very common in China. Um, but the, the, right now, it's 9.42 in the morning. There probably is a line 15 people long at Louis Vuitton to get in. Like, that is not what I think of, when I, right? It's not the best barometer either. Uh, definitely not. But like, when you see this all over, um, it, is, it is quite crazy. I do think that there's some overdevelopment, um, but that's just companies thinking that they need a floor of an office building for their six employees just to have it, to have three tea rooms. Um, and now they're like realizing they, maybe they shouldn't do that. Um, so there are vacancies. Um, like I, I would expect my, my office's rent to go down this year um, a little bit, but yeah, other than that, I mean, it, it depends like as a whole, China's economy is not collapsing. It's not on the verge of collapsing. Uh, if, when you come here, I think you'll, you'll see that. You know, the, I just had a conversation that the, the episode of Manifold that just came out uh, most recently was with this MIT economist, Yasheng Huang, who I listened oh, to it. The, the, the netizens, the Chinese netizens really don't like this guy because he, he does say some critical things about the Chinese economy and Xi Jinping and things like this. But, yeah. you know, one of the things I said to him is I said, that if you just follow innovation across many, many sectors in China, whether it's commercial air, aerospace, uh, space, um, EVs, semis, solar, you know, 
on every front, their technology is just advancing very fast. And so it's just hard to believe that that isn't going to pay off for the economy as a whole in the future. And it's not little niche industries. It's industries that are going to employ large right. people. So, um, yeah, so I, I can imagine there's going to be some difficult headwinds maybe from the property uh, sector. But other sectors seem to be very healthy. And uh, obviously, you're right in the middle of it. And should. Yeah, and I, I would say I, I've said very similar sentence as you many times in the last four or five months. Um, it's hard to believe a future, not just in China, but in Southeast Asia, in India, in Africa, in Central America, um, in the United States, where technology does not, techno the role that technology plays in our daily lives in 10 years will be unrecognizable from even what most people can predict right now. And to get there, we will get there. I promise you, we will get there. And even look at the last year, like people's lives really are changing. The way professors teach like has completely had to change, right? So um, it, it will be unrecognizable to get there or a lot of things must happen and they will happen. And so because they will play such a pivotal role in our lives, look how much people talk about cars because it's the second largest asset that people own it, it's like, sometimes I think, guys, should, it was, stop talking about cars. It's, it's kind of getting boring. But then I think back to the cars are pretty awesome. And, you know, it, it is, it has a lot of investment implications. And so these things are going to be bigger than cars. Like the amount of time that you discuss with your friends about like getting a new car is not, is not really that much. Think about the role that technology even today plays, but will play in 10 years in just the average conversation you have. It is going to be, you're going to spend, you're going to have so many subscriptions. You're going to have so, by the way, subscription models, like not like Netflix, like subscribing to entire things that we don't even have right now. Um, even like bat battery as a service. Like these are all things that, yeah, most people don't even think about, but you, you will, you will, this will be a part of your life very soon. And so uh, to get there, I think it, these things have enormous economic implications. And I see it as, especially with the US and China, China can get there without the US. The US can have a future if it closes itself off from China, but if it wants to have the future that I'm talking about, it has to work with China. And I think, I hope that we will get to that point and it will be glorious and we'll be happy again. Um, yeah. but it would be great. Yeah, like I'm, I'm very positive. As I, as I said to Yasha, it would be great if we could get back to a positive sum instead of zero sum game with, between the China yes. and the United States. So, yes. um, it is still positive sum because actually so many things are still going on in collaboration between American companies and Chinese companies. It's just that, you know, the zeitgeist is kind of against it. So it's, it's, it's kind of not something you talk about, but there's still very fruitful right. collaborations going on. Very so much. Yes. Let's let's maybe talk about EVs because I know you follow Tesla and BYD very closely. Um, now, my audience is not expert on EVs, so don't assume they're experts. On, you know that that they're insiders. And, okay. But maybe, well, maybe I'll say a few things that there is this huge transformation that's already taking place in China. The, the fraction of the, the 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 car sales every year now that are EVs in China is pretty substantial. I don't know what it is twenty percent, thirty percent. Um, almost 40, 40%. And, um, I think there's pretty good evidence that a lot of the most competitive EVs in the world right now are produced by Chinese companies. Maybe only Tesla, uh, is the one that could be with companies like BYD. Um, and although I think the U S it's maybe a very risky move for these Chinese companies to try to export directly to the U S almost every other country in the world, including say Germany, Israel are getting tons and tons of Chinese EVs right now. So maybe Taylor, you could just say what, like, give us your view of what's going to be in space. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to talk as broadly as I can. Um, yeah. Almost 40% of new passenger vehicle sales in China are, they call it new energy vehicle. It's electric vehicle, which includes battery electric vehicle and plug in hybrid electric vehicle. Not Mild hybrids, people think of like a Prius, like that's not an electric car. Yeah, no, it's not an electric car. 
But I think this is mostly Americans. They they don't know that like plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are like basically an electric vehicle, a BEV with a little range extender gas tank um, to alleviate range anxiety. So yeah, PHEVs are very real, um, very much an EV. In fact, a, a PHEV, a, a 2023 BYD, PHEV, the least efficient tongue, uh, driving for a year it and over its lifetime, including the emissions that you know were, it took to actually make the car, um, will be better for the environment than a Tesla, the most efficient Tesla, 2023, driving in Europe over its lifetime, if we assume the same lifetime. Um, that's, that's pretty crazy. So yeah, that um, should hopefully squash people who say PHEVs aren't EVs. But anyway, uh, almost 40% of EVs are, of, of new car sales are electric in China. Uh, you can see it, they make it very easy. It's good for, for car spotting because the license plates are green instead of blue. And so we, we kind of talk about green plates. The green plates are just, it's like not even a neighborhood. Like, let's say you have a really wealthy neighborhood and a very not so wealthy neighborhood in the same city. Well, normally to observe a, a car trend, the same trend wouldn't be, well, for it to be a real trend, it would have to happen in both communities. Here, it's happening at all levels. It's happening at the most expensive cars. Like people are literally selling their, their Rolls Royce yeah. for, for like a hi-fi because it's just cooler. The tech is just better. Um, it has these like neat tricks that, and then at the same time in, in the other communities, they, there are very attractive. You're not, most people don't know about them, um, because you know, they're not the sexiest cars, but those are also electrifying at a very rapid rate. And in both actually in all price segments, it's like the lines are essentially the same, uh, in terms of EV, EV adoption. What, what I, so what I say to my American friends who don't follow any of this, and maybe if they're a certain type of American, they think all Chinese stuff is crap. And so the, yeah. these Chinese EVs can't be any good. I just tell them, do the following thing. Go to YouTube, type in BYD EV, and you'll find an Australian guy in Australia or a British guy in the UK or a German guy in Germany reviewing the car, like a guy who makes his money from his YouTube channel reviewing the car that you could buy in Munich, which is made by BYD and saying this car is, you know, competitive. They might say, you know, it's this good or this good, but you can see the car is a quality car and people in those countries believe that. So right away, you should just realize, wait a minute, this is not how the world was a few years ago, right? There, China, yeah. China was nowhere near the number one car exporter in the world, but now they're, they might be. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the way that I can get people to upgrade their understanding very quickly is just to find a YouTube video where it's a Westerner in a Western market reviewing an exported Chinese EV. And then they'll suddenly realize, wait, the world changed in the last few years and I didn't catch it. But of course you're right. Let, let me see if I can, if I can even surprise you in this. Um, I have a, a lot of friends who work at automotive companies and some of them are legacy auto companies. Some of them are the newest ones. Uh, and a lot of them are Americans. They have torn down, you know, obviously they're not going to publish this. They've torn down the Chinese cars, the Chinese EVs, and their engineers are terrified and surprised and like just so impressed. So to hear that, you're not going to hear that that often, but I keep hearing this and I'm mostly, I, I like to ask like the logistics of how they, how they get them. Um, but uh, I mean, even the new Huawei phone, like hearing about how U.S. intelligence agencies were trying to figure out how they could like, do, how do we get someone to wait in line at a store to actually get one of these so we can tear it down? So they relied on YouTube tear it out. Hilarious. But uh, the, the, these uh, legacy auto companies, they're, they're tearing down these Chinese cars. People at Tesla are tearing down these Chinese cars. And I don't want to accuse anyone of reverse engineering. Um, but they are blown away. And that is something that, um, you know, you can, you can appreciate the build quality by looking at a, a, an average car in a parking lot. I do it all the time. Um, and, but 
But then you have to ask yourself, why is it that these Chinese cars are so consistently well built? And it's simply because, well, 90% of it is because it is built with robots. And I've toured these factories. Um, and, you know, I wish that these companies would, would really showcase their factories more. I understand why they don't. But, uh, you know, I was just at a factory in Chengzhou last month where it was 98% automated. That kind of rate of automation, you don't see in factories. Um, it is almost, and I actually would accuse them of like a little bit over automated because like, I mean, did you really need to buy the KUKA, you know, $3 million robot to like just pick up the car and move it over here? Like probably not, but um, yeah, the, the automation, and it's also why the batteries, the Chinese batteries are so much better. It's why the iPhone right now, the new iPhone is like having some issues because it's built in India and it's more, you know, uh, hand assembled. Uh, Chinese factories are the new Japanese, the new Toyota factories. Um, and not so ironically that they, they have a lot of Japanese robots in them. Uh, but that is, that is why the build quality, that is why the, the range has gotten so good because they're able to, to jam a lot more things into it because they have this precise manufacturing. And, uh, it is, it is hard to explain um, just how it's like, it really is like a symphony, um, to see two months ago, I saw 15 to 18 robots working on one part. Like it was, it was crazy. You just see these sparks flying. You couldn't even get within 10 meters of yeah. it, but they like, I can't believe that humans are this smart that they've created something to do a task that they're not capable of, you know, the, and you know, it's, yeah. The thing with AI is that you, you know, you have to have an algorithmic process that does it, but once you have it and you, you, you can validate that it works at a slower speed, but then once it's really working, it seems instantaneous to humans. So yeah. in the same way, if you have a concert of robots co cooperating to do something, the human can't even tell what's going on. But of course the engineers no. who designed it, did it in a systematic way. Yeah. And then of course now it's, you know, now it's running super, super fast. So yeah. Yeah. And, and another, another way I ex explain this and I think you would appreciate this. Um, I said this to some of my friends. They're like, Taylor, why did you just tell me? I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, it is very cool for me as a human to see AI or a sensor show me something that I can't see with my eyes. Yep. And so for autonomous vehicles, the technology is LIDAR. Yep. And I commute almost every single day to work and from work in a robo-taxi just because like, that's just how life is here. Um, and I, I love it and, um, you know, it's work. <laughs> um, but I, I, every single day I'm blown away by what the LIDAR picks up because not only would I have to turn my head on a swivel to sometimes see these things, it is seeing through buses because it, the LIDAR is mounted up higher. Um, same thing with radar. It's, you know, it's, it's bouncing off of the lead car and seeing a car, two or three cars ahead of you. Like to have a complete obstruction and then have so much visibility, something about it just is, is, is so, it's, it's a very interesting feeling. It, um, it has and I don't a, know if you've ever experienced something similar. Yeah, it has a different, completely different set of sensors than what we're used to using when we drive. Um, we have researchers, I'm in Michigan, so Michigan State has a pretty strong autonomous vehicle research program and also a lot of LIDAR experts actually. So. I'm familiar with what you're talking yeah. about. And the interesting thing for me was that Elon actually thought he could go without LIDAR. And he said, well, if, if humans can drive with just, you know, vision, ordinary vision, surely we can get the AI to do that. That may have been a mistake. I mean, obviously the dust hasn't completely settled on that strategy, but um, yeah, I, to me, it's like give the engineers I know, the professors uh, who work on autonomous vehicles here at Michigan and Michigan State, they're, they're like, give us all of the info feeds we can possibly get at a particular price point. Uh, and the AI will incorporate all of that into its decision-making. Yeah. And you know, with, with that decision, um, that for a lot of people in the industry is what really, um, pitted them against Elon Musk because it was in, in Elon's, in Elon Musk's, you know, history, it will go down as 
possibly the worst decision technology wise that he made because he, I mean, I, I know people now who were involved in those conversations really early on, even the original room that he was in when he was told about, you know, AP one, right. With, with mobile, um, before that, uh, so I know, I know the entire history of it. Um, that was an Elon Musk decision. And there were people who said, Elon, you can't do this, especially when human lives are at, at stake. And he fired them. So, you know, my respect for him went down a lot after hearing this and following. And now, you know, we can see the New York Times has posted things, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, um, about, you know, the paint it black video where they first showed that in 2016, this Tesla is driving itself. The human's only there for, you know, that video was completely faked. Uh, we know it crashed during that. Uh, so like, yeah, the, the can of worms is, is opening up, but LIDAR specifically, um, I, I, we consulted people who are experts, you know, I didn't study this in, in university. Like I have, a LIDAR is a very complex thing. Yeah. Um, so we had to consult a lot of people and now we actually do like, I can have an entire dinner with a LIDAR engineer and like, we can only talk about LIDAR. So, um, I'm not a complete idiot now, but, uh, it was, it was so crazy to see people in the technology industry who were like, I can't believe, not just that he said this, but that people still want to work for him after him, he said that. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but the cool thing about LiDAR specifically is that when he said that, the cost of a LiDAR, a Velodyne puck, um, 128 line, was like $28,000. Right now, a LiDAR unit, is less than $500 yeah. Yeah. in the technology hall of fame will have a dedicated section to LIDAR. And that is something that I don't think a lot of people appreciate. You can really only buy one car in the United States, a Lucid with LIDAR. It's not even turned on. So like Americans don't really know much about LIDAR. Um, they know that it, like looks ugly and everything. Now in China, I, we really want data on this and just there's no no one keeps track of this, but we, we estimate that 10% of new energy vehicles, new, new energy vehicles, um, have LIDAR. And it is like, again, when I first moved here in January, I saw very, I was taking pictures of LIDAR. I mean, I was taking pictures of LIDAR. Like I would take pictures of Tesla in 2012, like when I saw one. So it was, it, it was still so rare, but now. It is becoming, this is crazy. It is like trendy to have like a little LiDAR bump on your Neo or like, oh, you can't buy that Lee without like, you got to get the LiDAR. It's safety. Like, come on, you're buying this for your family. You need that safety. And some of it's actually a little like overblown because some of these companies aren't really doing much with the sensor right now. Um, they will in the future. But uh, yeah, it is. It's crazy that in the United States, you only have Tesla pretty much for electric cars. And that's even such a small percentage. In China, you have most, almost most new energy, uh, new cars are electric. Then you have in the, U in the US, people don't know what the word LIDAR is. In China, people are like kind of poking fun at each other because they didn't get a car with LIDAR because it's cool um, and it's safe and it's super high tech. I could make a bunch of compar comparisons like this um but yeah lidar is like suddenly sexy when um, uh, i mean crazy. From, from the perspective of engineering professors who do research on autonomous vehicles at michigan universities and this is going back a few years when lidar was super expensive it was it was it was, it was too expensive to be placed on an ordinary car but for the research vehicles that we were using it had lidar and the whole question was what is the cost curve of LIDAR going to look like? And now we've reached a point where, yes, you can afford to have it in almost every car. And so for sure, it's going to happen. Um, and the, the people who invested the time to build the software that can really use the LIDAR signal, the, the information that's gathered by the LIDAR, those people are going to build much better autonomous vehicles than the people who didn't invest in, in that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, I have a question. Um, what, what, what was the consensus of those who thought that it would fall to, I don't think anyone thought that it would go sub $1,000, but like sub $5,000. Yeah, I would have to. What was the reasoning? I would have to go back and look at, because uh, this was a few years ago when I was, I was the vice president for research and part of my portfolio was actually 
allocating money to the autonomous vehicle researchers on our campus so they could do this work. And um, I remember having lots of LIDAR discussions with them and the whole, and so having to read up on it myself. And the whole question is, what is that cost curve going to look like? And I think the most ambitious, most optimistic people probably were not optimistic enough about yeah. the, the cost decline for LIDAR. And so it's one of these great stories. Now, I don't know to what extent it's Chinese companies that are driving the cost curve for LIDAR, and maybe you're going to tell me it is, but it's just mm -hmm. amazing because the thing with complex new technologies, you never quite know how fast it's going to get cheap. And that, that's often the, the real constraining question. But what you're telling me now is like, we're going to see a ton of LIDAR in the future. Yeah. And I think I made this prediction, um, I think in 20, 2018, that China may require LIDAR in some aspects. Yeah. And... I, th I think the deadline was 2025, so we still have some time. Um, I'd maybe push it back a little bit, but you never know. Uh, but it is, it is, it may be seen as the safety belt, you know, the seat belt oh. of, of the automotive industry. And especially like when, it, when it's so cheap, this is also why Elon Musk is, is an idiot in a lot of ways. He was wrong about it because he was told how much it would cost. Now, it's at a point where he, he most certainly could have it. He toys, you know, $3,000 between the price of full self-driving capabilities. Um, so he definitely could. Why doesn't he? And people have quit over this because there have been very recent conversations. Hey, Elon, let's, let's, it's time to put the lighter in the car. And like, you're fired. Um, so it, the LIDAR, it may be politicized. I hope it isn't. Um, but American companies, Luminar has great LiDAR, but it has yet to scale. Um, which actually, I just got an email from their IR that their, their first at scale test uh, was successful. Um, but that, you know, we'll see it in some Volvos first. And, and then a, that's a, few a more Chinese, cars. that's a Chinese car though. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Right. That I, I know the team. Well, they're in China often. Yeah. Um, they, uh, yeah, the, the great company and great technology and, and some of their engineers will actually, one was just inducted to the, I think the Florida hall of fame of inventors or something for his role in, in developing LIDAR for, it's you know, much tough. cheaper, but the, you're talking about the national Academy of inventors. I I'm one of the, I, I'm also in that, uh, groups. Oh, really? <laughs> Congratulations. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so, so. American companies like, yeah, they, they've, they've made a lot of progress and definitely are responsible for this. Um, I'm kind of surprised that, that academics didn't, pers they were just buying it, I think, and not really reinventing it as much. And those who were Waymo pretty much poached all of them so that they could develop their own in-house ladder, which is also like, people don't talk about it because we don't know the cost, but like, it's not like they're at, you know, $50,000 a, a unit right now. They clearly have brought it down tremendously and their light is really good um but the chinese companies quietly have have done this and this shows especially for huawei it just shows like jokingly in the office in i think 2019 we said watch huawei this is before they were i mean they had like an automotive division but it was mostly like for you know their their os in a car um and when we said, watch Huawei, just, just make LiDAR, like just do it itself. And it did. And I, we should have bet each other because it did. And then DJI, the drone manufacturer based in Shenzhen, also Huawei's based in Shenzhen, uh, it, it also just came out of nowhere and made its own LiDAR, like automotive grade LiDAR. Wow. Um, and now what we, we do have a bet on is BYD will do this in-house. And right now it's invested in a few LiDAR companies. so. Um, that kind of complicates it, but they definitely could. And I, I would expect them to make, develop their own LIDAR. Um, and I mean, a company in which they invest just, just sold 20,000 LIDAR units last month. Take that people who said it wouldn't scale. Wow. So it, you know, this is the Chinese are doing some really great things. The, the, the tech, like it's one of those things that you develop the tech and it like, do we really need to improve it? past this like 
then we're going to start having like energy consumption concerns and like we don't need like a point cloud mostly because we don't have the software to do a lot of what they want for level two which is you know still you have to monitor the car um but for taking the driver out of the loop everyone agrees lidar is a, is essential um and so yeah this is that's happening with with chinese companies faster and and the other thing is the the process the, the um the software iteration really really shortens when you have a huge fleet of cars with this sensor right so it's not just like you know a, a university driving around its campus loop with lidar and saying like all right now pop out of the trees and oh yeah it picked you up now it's like we can you have to download all the data so that there's a big misconception that like you just have all this data like whenever you want no you have to you have to download the data and it's it's a lot and you're not going to send that over you know cellular but um it's it's a lot of data potential and you could just tap the fleet for an hour and just get a million edge cases yeah. now with a new layer and that is lidar so um tesla is even using it to ground truth to confirm its guesses yes um it's like it's it's just cool that there is a sensor that gives you truths you know and whereas everyone in in really computer vision machine learning is saying like well let's keep trying to guess let's keep trying to guess well now that the sensor that you would you would only use in testing is so cheap that you can just buy one on the internet yeah and you can use it yourself so that's that's really cool that um that has happened in just the last four years incredible and are now so coming coming back to like the, the factory visit where you saw the robotics and i don't know maybe you're calling on lidar companies as well is is that the source of alpha for you basically being able to actually visit these companies and see what they're doing um to talk about that a little bit it, it definitely i don't want to say it's it's all of it um but a site visit especially for us is the most valuable thing that we can do um i would rather have a site visit about something I know nothing about, and we've never done this, but I'd rather this than, and not read the company's annual report than spend a month of due diligence on one company, which would be crazy, and read every single filing they've ever had, read every single call they've ever had. And it, it, it pales in comparison to what you can learn from a site visit. So can you... and. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about like, okay, imagine you have a site visit. What's something that you learn from that visit, which could be like either a really positive signal for the company or a really negative signal? Like what are some examples of what you might discover from the site visit? Sure. Normally I wouldn't even uh, I'd broadly answer this. Um, but at this point, like if anyone wants to compete, you know, and, and the, they have to move to China, move all the way out here and like, yeah, and they'd have to find find this. So, um, yeah, I'll I'll actually tell you an example in detail. Um, I don't, my colleagues may kill me after this, but uh, we were at a, I guess I'll leave out the company name, um, but a battery factory, the most advanced battery factory in the entire world, um, outside of Chongqing, and battery factories are really complex and also highly secretive, and we so there's like there's not much prep you can do it except just comparing it to the last battery factory that you toured mm -hmm. or the you know a, a battery comparing like catl's battery factory six months ago to a byd battery factory right now like even that comparison i need to see the new cattle factory to really compare because they, they just they change you so quickly um but in this one factory uh well many factories but at this uh site we, it was their, their newest one. They want to showcase everything. And, and they, they flew out the, basically all of the top engineers, uh, not just for this fa particular factory, but for, you know, battery, their battery division. And, uh, so we asked them all the questions that we had prepared, and then we really just observed. And, and of course we'd ask questions specifically, like, what does this machine do? It does, is this a Chinese machine? And then that's the big question, you know? Is this an American machine? We didn't find any. So that would have been a real concern. Um, I mean, look what's happening in you know, semiconductors. Um, but 
so we're yeah asking specific questions about that but um like how long does retooling take and if you wanted to theoretically change the the density or even the the cathode uh, makeup like how long would that could you even do that in this factory could you even do that like why are you, why is this factory in this province like as many questions as we could and there was one part of the factory tour that we couldn't see and i've literally been strip searched like not fully but like like i had to roll down my my dress socks and um to see a battery factory so like they there's a no fly zone over some battery factories in china so you know it's a pride and joy of of chinese right now kind of they want it to be quiet but um so they're very they're very secretive but once you're in one they kind of you know you can you're here like we don't, we trust you um you've signed enough ndas uh but there's one section of this factory that we couldn't see and i i didn't want to be inappropriate and and really try to get in there because they're there are other things that companies that they're like, oh no, let's not let's not go there. We don't have time. But this one was they're they're being kind of weird about it. And so after the the factory, um, we had lunch, and I said, hey, why why couldn't we see that that part of the factory? And this is the part. If I say which part, it's kind of their secret sauce. So I, I maybe should be careful in this specific part. But it was, it was one specific. Which? Yeah, um, it, it was one specific part, and it wasn't part that i thought was particularly advanced i mean the whole process is advanced but it, it was it was strange and they said I'm, I'm really sorry taylor we but we just we can't we can't show that to you and i i tried and i tried and i tried and then finally they said to be honest i've never the person uh, i was talking uh, to, i've never even seen it yeah and so i i was like oh my god all right and i looked to my team and i was like we are going to do a week's worth of work on this specific part of the battery manufacturing process. And so we did. And, and in that, we learned, we don't know what they're doing, but we then can talk, you know, upstream, downstream. We can, there are suppliers. Like we, we know from another meeting that this company was bragging that we are in XYZ's newest battery factory in, involved and in make a machine for this specific part. Now we really investigate that company and doing that unlocks a ton of alpha i mean these are companies that we wouldn't have even considered you you go to like a, um you know any of these like battery expos and you would walk right past that that booth and no one else is there but that quietly is like holding up a lot of the innovation that's coming from from batteries so um that's just an example of, of how valuable site visits can be. And, and of course the conversations that you hear and, and really, if you ask good questions, you're going to get even better answers back. If you really do your homework, then they, they like that you're interested and know a lot about what they work on every day. And so it, it just, it just snowballs from there. Um, and we actually, when we do a site visit, we usually leave a day after for buffer because almost always, in fact, even this time I was just talking about the next day was a Saturday. And I said, I know you guys, the ones who are like showing us around and making it all pretty, uh, like are flying back tonight because you told me, but I'm staying in Chongqing because I always do this. Can I come back? And I want to see the specific part of the, the pack assembly that we kind of skipped over. And so the next day I, I went out and, um, and I saw it and like, that was also super valuable. So yeah, we all, it always leads to something else. Um, and so that's why going out to the middle of nowhere, it seems in China, um, can really, really pay off. So if I could recapitulate that. So, so it, when I asked you the question, I thought you were going to be primarily telling me like what you learn about the company you're visiting, but it seems like sometimes what you're learning is about their supply chain. And then you discover another company that's super valuable that, you know, is integrated yep. in their supply chain and has some unique. Uh, capabilities yes. and then you that becomes so it's not just about yeah right it's not just about that company it's a it, we've of course learned a lot about it but yeah we we come back our notes i've even dedicated in my notepad a section where i just write companies that i hadn't heard of and a lot of them are chinese and so they write it like 10 different possible ways in yeah. opinion but um yeah like it it, it 
always. And this is this just was not true in the United States. Also, site visits are so complicated in the US. Like they're so secretive about everything. And and they're like, no, like how if you don't disclose how much, you know, you have in us, like uh, we're not gonna even entertain like you can't even join our our earnings call. Like um so yeah, the Chinese, they're very like open arms about this stuff. And I mean, even Huawei, like there's no reason for me to go to Huawei. It is very hard to get a meeting at Huawei because I can't own them, but I can own a lot of companies involved yes. with Huawei. And so that's like, that's a, another thing that, you know, an example of maybe I won't, I won't learn. I can't do anything with the value that I, I see at Huawei specifically, but throughout its entire supply chain, there are so many more companies. And this, these are A shares. That's the other thing, like to kind of tie it all together. These are companies that aren't listed on Hong Kong that no American has heard of. And I know because when, I, when we research them, like sometimes we'll even search Twitter and it'll be like, like your guest two weeks ago, like sometimes it'll be only him. But, um, you know, no one talks about this stuff. And then you type in the Chinese name and like, of course, there are message boards and like, you know, threads that people have and on it. Um, but they're, they're just as like highly technical. Um, and so, yeah, then you have to go do a site visit with that company. And like, if you, if you were to read any like white paper on LIDAR, for example, it would, it would kind of be boring. I think if you go and see, visit a LIDAR company, they say, look what our car can, look, this car can see because, you know, they're engineers. Completely different. So you it want just, to you like yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we, we, that's all we do pretty much. Can I ask you, so, from coming to company. So can I ask you, like, uh, I think one of the classic stories and standard stories in China is that people invest in property excessively because they're unwilling to invest in the stock market and the stock market is just kind of a little bit crazy. In terms of how efficient that market is, so, so let's suppose you identify a company that's crucial to the whatever BYD battery supply chain, and that's an awesome company with a unique technology, and you're just confident they're going to have like very good growth numbers in the next few years. Are you then confident that by buying that stock, the market is actually going to cause the value to appreciate in the proper way, reflecting their, you know, their growth and revenue and sales? Or is the market there just kind of crazy and you can't depend on it doing the right thing, even though you made the right prediction about their, their future growth? You're, you're very smart because that's an excellent question. Um, it, it's something that we are trying to, to figure out what we can do, especially, you know, legally and everything with like if we publish research, yeah. like if we if we sniff this out, yep. if we publish research on this. Yep. That's not really in our scope right now, but like others would would see this and they would uh, you know, you just put two and two together. And certainly sometimes you can't say like because I was touring this factory, I, I learned about, you know, this and this. Yep. But but there are tons of ways that you can otherwise do it. Um and what why I'm confident to answer the first part is Unfortunately, when when we look up these companies, I mean, these are companies that like, what's the ticker? All right, uh, yeah. And how do you spell it? And then you you look at the stock chart, and you're like, of course, of course, someone else beat us to this. It, you know, so I have I have some quite a lot of confidence because more often than not, that is the case. And especially like when you start to sniff out this this you know what's happening with Huawei in the last two months. Um, that is very often the case. And sure, a lot of those companies, because after whatever, September 1st, when it was the first day of trading after it was, it was unveiled, um, then, then those, those companies soared. But if I, I actually literally texted or we chatted um, a, a person who we may um, go into business with about this, I said, this is a good case study for our two teams to come together and learn from because now that if we had just known about these companies, they they're they're publicly traded. I definitely and even if we didn't know about because you know you go back you you back test all of this and even pretend that we didn't know. But this is more like synergies between our two teams. Uh, like who from your research team? Like get, I want to know exactly what we would have done. I want to know exactly how this person would have said, "Hey, 
on the latest, like, you know, the equivalent of like Mac rumors for Huawei, there, there is like the phone case companies got new molds and it really looks like a mate series. Like, you know, if, if we were to have sniffed some of that out, even if we had it, even if it was a complete surprise, we need to have an action plan on how we would have quickly come together, wh exactly where that spreadsheet is located and quickly have a, a meeting and say, let's buy this because this is, it is, and it's, when you look back, it guaranteed that that company's stock price will go up considerably. Yeah. So you, and they, yeah. Well, I think you answered my question because you said more often than not, someone got there first, which, which means the market efficiency is kind of there. And so you can rely on it. It'll yeah. only get more efficient over time for sure. Um, like, but more often than not is over 50%, but it, I, I would say net, like if we, if we had a strategy that only invest that way, then I think it would be like in the last two years, like up 15%. Yeah. Equal weighted. Yeah. Um, so that's not what I'm really going, like we need to dive into it more. Um, and also that's just broadly, like every single stock chart that I've looked up that I had never heard of the company before. Um, and there are definitely some ma macro elements to that. Uh, but, but it needs to be all the time. Like I would say if, if we were this good about doing this with American companies or just Western companies, then we would, it would, you know, be up 200% in the last two years. So, because it's just more obvious, it is like that you can go on CNBC and, and, you know, talk about it. And, um, but in China, like there, we're kind of trying to figure out the equivalent and again, like remaining legal and right about everything. Um, but you know, this is, this is research. Um, so we want more people to know this. Now, here's the thing that we're learning in, in discussing, um, with Chinese LPs, they all have a conversation just like this. And they'll be blown away. They'll be like, how, wow, how can you think like that? And it's like, I, I don't know, like the, the American school. So like, I, I don't, I can't point my finger to it, but, and because it's not just me, it's all of my colleagues think the exact same way. And I think if you get, if you asked even like the typical college student uh, in the US, like you kind of line up everything and you heard about this company, you're not supposed to visit this part of the battery factory. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you stitch that together with, you know, like, how do you not stitch that together? But the Chinese are like, and these, these are like the, the top engineers, like the smartest people, the executives of these companies. And they're, they're every single day, they're like blown away by, by this. And it's, I don't know why, but then they're like, Taylor, what else, what other ideas do you guys have? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I mean, let's keep, let's keep looking into companies because we keep finding more opportunities. Um, so I think that a strategy like that is so foreign to the Chinese and it's convenient for us because there aren't others who are, who are doing this, who are being excited about China, who are loud, who will go on podcasts. Like, because of all of that, maybe we could... In, in the smallest way, change the way that, that at least equity research is done. And therefore, you know, that drives volumes. And also, like you said earlier, excites Chinese people about their own companies. Yeah. Like they, they really will all the, like I can give examples. I, I sh definitely shouldn't say, but broadly there are people who it's their job, the Chinese people who it's their job to invest in A shares. We'll go to dinner and they'll ask me what I think about NVIDIA <laughs> and not by the way, about like the stock, like, and, and I'm like, do you even have like a US dollar account? Like, yeah. Probably <laughs> do. Why are you asking me this? Uh, yeah, they probably do. That's why. Um, but, but like they, there's, there isn't a lot of excitement to be honest. And I think that we can, it, again, in 10 years, there will be excitement. Uh, so much has to go wrong for there not to yeah. be. So you it's know, just, and, and there will be foreign investors flooding in here. You know, Taylor, the, the way I would explain this to you, because I'm older than you, um, is yeah, please. a lot of people who are from China and they've seen it all. They've seen the economy go from, you know, you remember how shitty it was when you first went there as a student, right? Compared to the way it is yeah. now. They're familiar. That's most of their life. So they, they've seen when the Chinese products were shitty, they were all copied. Um, when 
even at Bay Dodge, Xinhua, the best researchers were not world class. That's their life, what they've experienced. So they're not they're not prepared for this moment where actually only now, only now is this inflection point happening where the Chinese companies are getting ahead in real innovation and efficiency of production and automation. It's it's all new to them. So you're young, so you're seeing this for the first time. This is the world for you, right? But for them, they've already lived through all this other crap and they're conditioned to that. So it's just gonna take a while before they figure out like, oh, I see Chinese companies can actually be world-class, not, not fake world-class, but really world-class. I'll tell you a very interesting story. So in the 90s, I had a collaborator in theoretical physics who was at one of the main Korean universities. And I used to go visit him. And at that time, the Korean auto companies were not as far advanced as they are now. Now Kia and uh, Hyundai are you know, pretty competitive with any other brands, right? But at the time they were pretty shitty. And I remember talking to my Korean colleagues in Korea and I would point to a Hyundai and I say, hey, that looks really good because, you know, they, they were pretty aggressive in their designs early on. I said, that looks like a nice car. And the Koreans would just turn to me and say, you know what? The powertrain, the engine, it all comes from Japan. We can't do any of that yet. So th they were not ready to accept. If I had said to them, wow. Can I buy shares in Hyundai or Kia and will that be a top global brand in 10 or 20 years? They would have said, no, we can't do it. We have to. It, it's hollow. It's it's not real inside. And a lot of the Chinese people you talk to live mostly through that era. And it's only now that you're in the right place at the right time, I believe, because I do think companies like Huawei and BYD are going to lead the world in their categories. But most Chinese people are not going to quite, they're not quite ready to accept that. Yes. And that's, the, I appreciate that perspective. And um, I, we have, but took us some time to develop uh, that as well. Uh, it would have been nice to put it so succinctly as you have. Um, it, that, is, that is fundamental to the future of my company in China is, is how, do we, how do we benefit from that and how do we maybe change that at least in convincing LPs is, is my favorite thing, right? So like I, I, I obviously like to talk um, and so, so I'm, I'm very excited about that, but then what, like it also in the U S it's very easy to identify, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, but when you talk to executives and top engineers at these companies for you to identify the leaders, like a lot of them will be very honest, um, because they're so smart. They don't have time to think about how should I trick him? Um, but th they'll say, you know, look, we're, we're number three and, and it's like, oh, interesting. I, I would have thought you were number one. Like now I have to go look at those two companies ahead. Yeah. Um, but, but in, in China, it is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two quick things. One, one story is I was talking to the chief scientist of artificial intelligence at, at Tencent. Um, and I asked him, I said, um, who do you think leads? in artificial intelligence. I'm not an AI expert, but you literally are. Who leads in AI, the United States or China? And this was, you know, a recent conversation. And so large language models and everything was, you know, fresh in the mind. And he said, huh, I've never thought of that. And I was like, oh, flip the table. Like this, is, I think about this every single day. Well, how do you not think about this? And uh, he said, I would have to say, I would have to say uh, the United States. Now, granted, this he was educated in the U.S., so that's a little caveat. But um, he, he got his PhD in the U.S., I should say. Uh, and I, I said, okay, interesting. Why? Why do you think that? And he said, well, because in China, first of all, we don't have the close like relationship with professors. They, they the Chinese who are educated in the U.S. are obsessed with the access that they have to people like you. Like that is something that is unique about the United States. And it's something I didn't appreciate until I asked, and all of them say this. Um, and, but so they, they, they say that academics are, you know, it's better in, in the US. But then he said, you know, look at, look at uh, ChatGPT. And I was like, I mean, I have enough conversations with smart people in this field to know that like, let's not, let's not go on a full, like, you know, ChatGPT specifically is going to change the world. I mean, I use it every day, but, um, you know, say it for what it actually is. 
And he said, but he, he went somewhere I didn't expect. He said, America can just release that. And also this week, China had just passed rules on regulation specifically for large language models and everything, which is so classic China and so classic like the United States, right? This is um, a very emblematic story. And he said they could just release it. They didn't have to get any approval. They can just they can just release it, and then they just start collecting tons and tons of more data. And uh, uh, and that's that that is why the United States leads. Now later in the conversation, I was asking him about large language models, and I said, you know, I know ten cents working on one and actually two. And uh, you know, have you used it? When do you think like it's going to come out? And he he held out his phone. He was like, I use it every day. And I was so I said. Oh, wow. Like, how does it compare? Because some of the Chinese ones like aren't as great. Um, and he said, oh my God, it's, it's so much better than ChatGPT. And I was like, you just, your, your yeah. evidence was just that, you know, that ChatGPT is better. And, you know, that's why America wins in the AI race right now. And he said, well, the thing is, we can't release ours. So it's just, we can only use it internally. And I thought that was fascinating because that in his mind, like in my mind, I, I come to a very different conclusion yeah. if we're just using yeah. that evidence. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that keeps happening. And it's like, like I'll literally be in a web with taxi with no driver. And I'll ask like an engineer, hey, who do you think is ahead in self-driving cars? And they'll say, no one will put Tesla's number one, but they'll like put Tesla in the top 10. And I'm like, You've worked for four of the companies who I have in the top 10. How can you put Tesla there? And they're like, well, because they, they can just release whatever the hell they want. And if, if like one state shuts it down, they just go to the next state and they'll find some mayor who will let them test in their city. And like, that's what they think of as dominance. They think of, it's kind of like how Americans have this odd obsession with freedom. There, there are definitely reasons to love freedom, but Sometimes they, people obsess over it and yeah. they like it for reasons that are kind of crazy. But same, same thing here. Like they, they think that to be, to lead is to just run and break things. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just not how I see it. Um, I think, and I don't know, it's, it's kind of a weird cultural thing. Maybe. A little bit of this is grass is always greener. So like their number one headache yeah. might be, well, wow, I can get loads of really good engineers that I don't have to pay that much and they're awesome and I can actually get plenty of compute and risk capital. But the, my main headache is the regulatory thing or whether the government's going to be okay with what I do. So maybe they're a little bit obsessed with that. Whereas the American guy is like, wow, these Chinese guys have so many top engineers and they they have don't seem to lack capital. And you know, so it could always be something like that. The, I think the other thing, which I, you probably already know, but you'll discover if you don't already know it, is that in a Confucian culture, everything is under promise and over deliver. So, so nobody's going to say like, we're number, we're, I mean, they're going to be much less willing, certainly than Elon to say, I'm number one, we're number one, ours is the best. They're, they're actually going to, even if they feel that internally, they're not necessarily going to express it as energetically as an American would. So that's a big part of it. Um, yes. So. And, and I, and that's why I kind of, I'm also cautious not to try to change too. I don't want to be too much of a bull in a China shop, even though that literally is what I am. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I don't want to try to change their, their culture and they, they have one that's so much deeper than the one from which I come. So I, I but at the same time, it's also helpful to have an outsider point out, you guys are great. Like you are, I was trying to tell an autonomous vehicle company this the other day, like it was someone in, you know, they weren't an engineer. So maybe that's why, but I said, who do you think is like number one, two, three, four, five. And she said, well, I think that we are, we are, uh, I think we're number two and it was behind an American company. And I was like, oh my gosh, that like, this is, that is crazy that you said that. Cause like, I wouldn't put them there, but like, there, there are, and every way you look at it, your company is better than they. But I happen to put another Chinese company ahead of this company. And, and then I'll say it, it, it was, I was talking to Baidu Apollo and, and I said, I put Pony AI, which is also Chinese, ahead of, of you guys. 
And they said, she said, what? Are you kidding me? They're just a startup. She said it like, like, you mean pony, like the startup pony? Uh -huh. And I, I said, I said, oh my gosh, wow. You, you like, it was kind of both things. Like she thought that they weren't the best when they were way better than Waymo. And, but then she thought that they were better than pony and pony. So you know what I did? I said, let's go downstairs. And I called a pony and we rode in it and she definitely went back and had many meetings about that. Um, and I explained the reasons like she, I think was looking for, you know, at different things maybe. Um, but yeah, it, we, we kind of struggle with that every day. And so I think it's better to point out when companies are doing really well and, and also tell companies like when, the, what they need to improve. But the last thing is that the Chinese companies are so willing to work with each other. It is so, I, I want to say it's refreshing because American companies will be literally headquartered right next to each other <laughs> and will just like pretend the other doesn't exist or like make life hell for the other. And in China, certainly it's, it's encouraged, but it's like, you see this with friendships too. You see this with like, like executives will say, oh, you're trying to get a meeting with this other company that even could be their competitor. This has happened. Oh, let me just WeChat them and, and I'll set up a meeting. And it's like, wow, Americans are so conniving or maybe ah. the Chinese like don't think things through, but like it, they, they really like to cooperate and be helpful. And this is why I see a huge technolo technological revolution happening right now. Like, it's, yeah, of course it's been happening. But like, I mean, on a chart, the blink of the hockey stick curve for Chinese tech is this year, probably next year. Like it is just now happening. Like you can see the factories that are being built. You can see the policies that the government is, is coming out with. Like, I think they're gonna have a laissez-faire approach. If you look at like the ed tech space, they walloped us. But that was like overnight. No one saw that coming. But now they, they set the rules because it was getting a little too crazy. They set the rules and now they say, go play. And the Chinese government doesn't usually say go play, but they know that this is the first time where, you know, a lot of Chinese government officials are engineers. This is the first time that a lot of, of companies have smarter engineers or are inno innovating faster than, you know, what's going on at Tsinghua or like it's, this is kind of new for them. And so they are, they're setting the, the framework. And then now these companies are just, they're going to play and they're going to play with each other and they're going to build teams, but they'll be okay if they trade players between them. Like it is because they're all going the top. Um, and so I don't even see China doing this innovate or leave approach anymore. Like even that it's like, remember a few years ago when like there are too many EV companies and the government was like, this is no, this is inefficient. Like let's, let's consolidate. And, and that was good. And now like now. I think there even could be, like, could you have a Lucid or a Rivian equivalent in China? I, yeah, I think you actually can um, because the environment is, is, is actually like really welcoming to that. And we didn't see that until about a decade ago in China. So uh, it's, it's awesome where China's at right now, but it's so much more awesome to think about where China will be in the future. And in ways that I think your listeners can even um, really get excited about, like, Ways that, yeah, maybe LIDAR and stuff like won't change their specific lives, but ways that will change their lives every single day at a, you know, more than I would say like large language models do now. Like, and that's a very substantial change, more possibly than what the smartphone, it's hard to say, but more than the uh, smartphone uh, yeah. uh, really did, you know? So it's, that's super exciting. And those technologies are even some that you and I may not even know exist, could exist. And I think that's the most um, exciting thing for me. And hopefully we invest in companies that help make that possible. Well, Taylor, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I've used up a yeah. lot of your time, but I really enjoyed it. I'm sure we can actually Thank go you. on for hours. Uh, I hope maybe I'll visit yeah. you in China at some point and we'll continue to- Please do. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like therapy for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to talk to too many people in the US about this stuff. So. It's actually really helpful. Great. Well, love to have you back on the show also. Uh, that would be fantastic.